Şimdi sevgili dostlar, yani e, klasifike etmekten hoşlanmaz kimi insanlar. Sınıflandırmaktan ayrıştırmak. Ama mevzuyu da yani bir mevzuyu irdelerken de işte derecesine göre, ağırlığına göre falan bir sınıflandırmak gerekir ya. Yani değil mi? E, bir kategorize etmek gerekir. Klasifike etmek gerekir ki iyice çözümlensin. Şimdiki sunumumuzda güvenlik açıkları da sınıflandırılmalı. Bir güvenlik açıkları da sınıflandırılmalı ama neye göre sınıflandırılmalı diye konuşuluyor, soruluyor. Bu yazılım güvenliğinin temellerine hakim olarak sınıflandırılmalı cevabıyla karşılanıyor. Tabii daha bir sürü şey var da yani ben bu kadar ancak çözebildiğim bir şey. E, gayrisini siz çözün lütfen. E, benim e, Sayın Klimt Gübler e, dostumuz bu mevzuda, bu ağır mevzuda son derece akıcı bir sunum yapacak. Siz de zaten mevzuya intibak edeceksiniz. Yani benim gibi değilsiniz ki yani. Hadi bakalım. Hey Clint, welcome my friend. It is great to have you on our on our virtual stage. How are you? How are things over there? Yeah, things are great. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, honored to be here. Yeah, today it is it is you're going to have a very interesting topic and I know that you are one of the most important AppSec experts over there and you have a deep knowledge and background in the DevSecOps side. Man, I'm really excited for your presentation. So I don't want to lose any time. And I want to leave the stage to you. The virtual stage is yours, my friend. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. All right. Yeah, I'll uh, share my screen. Please. And I will have some questions for you. <laughs> great. Then. I'm we looking forward to come it. Come together again. Great. So have a yeah. great presentation. Bye. Thank you. See you soon. All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, so my name is Clint, and today I'm going to be talking about eradicating vulnerability classes by embracing secure defaults and invariants. Uh, so if you want, the link uh, down at the below will give you access to these slides. Um, so you don't have to write everything down. You can just easily access it afterwards. All right. So in this talk, we're going to be covering a bit of a different approach to security than I think many other talks and really the industry uh, as a whole over the past maybe 10 or 20 years. We're going to be focusing on how do we kill bug classes? You know, How do we build these scalable, systematic, long-term wins? We'll discuss how to enable developers to move both fast and securely, You know, because really, as a security team, we want to be business enablers, not another point of friction. And most importantly, we're going to discuss how to do this at your company using free and open source tools. So before we get into it, a little bit about me. So my name is Clint. I am the head of security research at R2C. We're a small San Francisco-based uh, security startup building a open source lightweight static analysis tool. Uh, before that, I was a technical director and research director at NCC Group, a global security consulting firm. Uh, and before that, I was a grad student at UC Davis, where I dressed like this. Um, so feel free to reach out on Twitter. I also do a security newsletter called TLDRSec, where I have a weekly digest of sort of the latest and greatest uh, security tools and blog posts, uh, summaries of talks, and things like that that help you keep up with uh, all the great things happening in security. OK, so in this talk, we have four major parts. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about why focusing on bug finding isn't the answer, then how to eradicate entire vulnerability classes, sort of a big picture methodology. Then we'll get a little bit more tactical, discuss some tools and techniques to make this real in practice. And finally, we'll talk about some exciting community collaborations that are currently ongoing. OK, so why bug finding isn't the answer. So a term I'm going to use a little bit is uh, invariant, which uh, sounds very fancy. But really, it just means a property that must either always or never be true. And sort of the key insight here from a security point of view is that when you uh, don't need any context to make a decision, you know, when something should either always be allowed or denied, 
this requires no uh, continuous operational time for the security team. So it allows you to uh, build things and invest in some tooling or infrastructure that then gives you uh, long-term uh, security leverage. So I'd like to start with a quiz. Um, you know, does this app have cross-site scripting? So I give you a random web app, you've never seen it before. Uh, how might you determine this? So in practice, there's probably a lot of questions you have. You know, what sort of user input can be provided to the application, and what's the structure of the data the user can provide? Is it, you know, just a boolean or an int to float, uh, maybe arbitrary JSON, maybe even uh, HTML uh, and so forth? Um, you know, is that input filtered by the application before it's stored in the database? And there, how is it stored? Is it a, you know, int float boolean uh, arbitrary string in the database? Maybe you care about the database type. Uh, and then when the information is returned from the database to the application, uh, it, does the IA web app process it? Does it filter it? Uh, and then when it's sent to the user's browser, is it included in HTML and HTML attribute, JavaScript, and so forth? So there's all these types of things that you probably would be curious about to determine, you know, does this have cross-site scripting in it? But what if I were to say that we have uh, enforced this invariance in the application, that is, the front end is entirely in React, and we've banned the function dangerously set inner HTML. So uh, React is a modern uh, front, -end uh, front end library that actually eliminates uh, pretty much every type of cross-site scripting, uh, assuming you don't use the escape hatch that is um, opting out of the protections they provide. So if I were to say that this application enforces this invariant, the front end only uses React and we ban this function, a lot of the things that you used to care about are no longer quite so important. And the idea here is let's solve the easy version of the problem. You know, this app could have been incredibly complex with millions of lines of code, but with some strong invariance, we significantly reduced its risk. And note that we did this without some sort of fancy tools, right? We didn't have a very complex DAS tool that could handle, you know, single page apps uh, and modern front ends with uh, lots of mo moving pieces. We didn't have a very expensive SAS tool that can track user input across dozens or hundreds of files. We didn't use like fuzzing or symbolic execution or like formal methods like proving that it's correct. You know, all these things we didn't have to do, but we still have some strong security guarantees. One way I like to think about this is what are we, what task are we trying to perform versus what effort is required to accomplish that? Uh, and the y-axis here is in CHUs, which is a uh, Clint's hand wavy units. Uh, and so if you think about it, detecting the use of a secure library or the use of an insecure one, like this is pretty easy. You don't need a lot of uh, analysis complexity. But to find a potential bug, this takes even more work. To confirm that uh, a potential bug is actually a real bug uh, is even more work. And then finally, writing a proof of concept exploit demonstrating that, yes, this is exploitable in practice uh, is even more work. And what I'm getting at here is detecting the lack of use of secure defaults uh, or just the use of secure defaults is just computationally so much easier uh, and higher signal in practice than finding bugs. So uh, you might be thinking right now, like, yeah, this is kind of your opinion, man. Uh, all you've shown me is some hand wavy diagrams. That's not really scientific proof. And you know, as an industry, we focused on bug hunting for decades, right? And we spent you know hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars on SAST and DAST and pen tests and bug bounty and all sorts of other things. So you know, yeah, that's your opinion, but uh, why change, you know, something that we've already been doing? So yes, so far, this has been some, uh, my opinion and some charts that I've hand wavily created, but let's look at what other companies are saying, not just me. Okay, so this is a great talk from uh, Patrick and Asta of Netflix from Apps at Cali a few years ago. So on the left-hand side, we see some things that their security uh, AppSec team is deprioritizing. So manual testing and traditional vulnerability scanning, uh, for example, because these are hard to scale uh, across, say, hundreds or thousands of internal apps. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, under heavily emphasized, uh, we see paved road, which is building secure defaults that make it easy for developers to do the right thing uh, at scale. And then also killing bug classes, not just one-off uh, bug fixes. So this is a study by Microsoft where they found that in the transition from XP to Vista, essentially banning stir copy and related functions uh, would have or did reduce 41% uh, of the vulnerabilities um, uh, in this study. So that's uh, pretty good for banning a few dangerous functions. All right, so this is a, an excellent book from Google. Uh, actually, the PDF is available for free online. And in it, they say, it's unreasonable to expect any developer to be an expert in all these different subjects and being vigilant when they're writing code. A better approach is to handle security 
in common frameworks and languages and libraries. And ideally, these libraries only expose an interface that uh, when you write code in them, it, it makes common classes of vulnerabilities essentially impossible. Um, and I think this is uh, really important, right? So we expect developers to ship new features quickly and to make them be robo uh, sorry, robust and be able to handle you know, millions of transactions a second. And uh, putting another onus of security on them as well is perhaps not fair because that's not their background. So ideally, as security professionals, we want to enable developers to do their job uh, better, easier, faster, and also transparently uh, to many security concerns as much as possible. This is a blog post from Facebook um, in which they say we invest heavily in building frameworks that help engineers prevent and remove entire classes of bugs when writing code. Um, so they have this uh, inverse pyramid where the bottom, the base of it, in which they try to catch as many bugs as possible is, again, secure frameworks. OK, so you might be thinking, hey, uh, this is great, but I'm not Google. I don't have you know, hundreds of security engineers. But I think you can get a lot of these benefits, uh, and the principles still stand regardless of the size uh, of your company and the resources you have. And one idea is you know, the framework and tech choices you make really matter. So if making the right uh, choices, for example, a modern uh, front-end framework or a modern web application framework can mitigate classes of vulnerabilities. Uh, and there's also some secure by default libraries uh, that I've listed here, and there's many others. Uh, so you don't have to write everything from scratch. You can leverage what's already out there. OK, so I hope that I've convinced you of the value of secure defaults and not trying to do one-off bug uh, hunting. That That is useful, but it, it's ultimately not going to, I think, systematically scale your company security posture. OK, so how do we eradicate vulnerability classes? Um, so this talk is actually a condensed version of a upcoming global AppSec SF talk I'm giving. So uh, for a bit more methodology details, uh, check it out. OK, so before we get into it, let's discuss the compounding effects of killing bug classes. So let's say you did a time audit of your AppSec team to figure out where are you spending your time. Let's say you're like, OK, we're spending some time running security tools and dealing with cross-site scripting and SQL injection and so forth. So let's say you were to think, all right, we're spending a lot of our time on XSS. Let's try to move to, say, React on the front end or have a uh, output encoding library that everyone uses. And let's say you're able to basically eliminate that class of issues or at least significantly reduce it uh, in your company. Then all of that time that you used to spend on XSS, now you can uh, apply to other things. For example, let's say killing a SQL injection by writing in uh, common a data model access library that everyone uses. So the idea is, uh, by tackling classes of issues, we are becoming compoundingly more effective and leveraged as a security team over time, which is important, right? Because we're often outnumbered by developers. So we need to be more leveraged uh, without scaling our person time. OK, so our methodology has five core steps. So we're going to first evaluate which vulnerability class to focus on. Then we're going to determine the best approach to find and prevent it at scale. We're going to select a safe pattern. You know What does good look like and make it the default? We're going to train developers to use it. And then we're going to use tools to enforce that pattern. OK, so let's step into each of these in more detail. So first, you know what should we focus on? So there's lots of um, criteria you could use. It depends on your company. But some common ones are choosing the bug classes the most prevalent, happens the most often, or perhaps the highest impact or risk issues. Maybe they're not that common, but when they do happen, they're very important. Maybe there's certain issues that are easier to tackle than others, either organizationally or technically. Maybe your company has certain priorities that you care about. Uh, or realistically, maybe it's a function uh, of all of those. OK, so first, uh, in order to do this process, you need a, a good vulnerability management program. So ideally, you need to know, you know what's your current state, like what sort of issues are we seeing in practice right now. And you also need to be able to measure, you know, are our future efforts actually working? right? So. Um, you don't want to spend uh, person weeks or months working on something and then not be able to tell if it actually measurably improved your security posture after. So some things that are good to track. What's the severity uh, of each bug that you encounter? What's the vulnerability class? Is it cross-site scripting versus SQL injection or so forth? You know, what was the source code responsible? Uh, and a couple of other things. So using uh, this historical data, we want to build a list of prior vulnerabilities, which we can then review for trends. So you can source these issues, either from, uh, say, Jira or GitHub issues or other issue trackers, maybe mining commit history, uh, looking at your DAST or SAS tools uh, or pen test reports, and so forth. So after you've gathered a list of issues, a uh, list of historical vulnerabilities, you want to review them for trends. right? So within a bug class, for example, cross-site scripting, 
uh, does the vulnerable code look similar um, or does it always look different? Ideally, it looks similar because then we can generalize a bit. So going uh, back to the criteria we had before, ideally, you're going to be able to choose a vulnerability class that is widespread, uh, widespread across many teams and repos. Ideally, it's high risk. It's feasible to get developers to fix it. They care about it. Uh, perhaps it aligns with company priority, uh, company priorities, and it's always broken in the same way. So in practice, not all of these will apply to every vulnerability class, but this is a, a good thing to strive towards, to have at least a couple of these be true. OK, so how do we find and fix or prevent these at scale? So uh, depending on what you're trying to do, there's different approaches. Um, for example, big picture architectural flaws, threat modeling might be the best approach. But in this talk, we're going to focus on uh, finding either known good or known bad code. And to do that, we're going to use uh, lightweight static analysis. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a second. OK, so now we want to select a safe pattern and make it the default. So perhaps your company has some internal coding uh, guidelines. You want to embrace, say, NIST standards, or perhaps you have your own expertise. Uh, or you know, why not uh, leverage the great work that's been done by OWASP and the Cheat Sheets or ASVS project to say, oh, this is what good looks like for this um, problem uh, uh, domain, for example, like parsing XML or something like that. OK, so once we've decided what good looks like, we want to make it the default everywhere. So update all the internal coding guidelines, anything that a security professional or developer would reference. Uh, so readmes, uh, developer docs, wiki pages, facts, and so forth. Uh, and one thing that I think is quite clever is working with the developer productivity team. So middle-sized and bigger companies sometimes have an engineering team that's focused solely on how do we make our internal development better. Uh, and ideally, we want this secure version to have an even better developer user experience than the old way. So how do we increase developer productivity and security? Uh, so one uh, clever way to do that is to integrate security at the right points. For example, new project starter templates. So if in your company there is a one specific repo that everyone uh, clones and forks to create a new, uh, say, microservice, for example, if you put the security controls in there, then everyone who uh, pulls from that, which should be anyone starting a new service, uh, if that's sort of the standard practice in your company, then they're just getting uh, the security mechanisms you provided uh, automatically for free. Um, so rather than convincing people, you know, it's just transparently getting added everywhere. Uh, and one quote I like a lot from Asta is, uh, hitch your security wagon to developer productivity. So next, we want to train developers to use the safe pattern. So how do we make sure that's successful? So we want to make sure that uh, what and why something is insecure should be clear, ideally in terms that developers care about and understand, not um, some complex security jargon, um, say like uh, cross-site scripting or SQL injection or things that they may have heard of but uh, are very familiar with. We want to convey impact uh, in terms developers care about. So you know this is a uh, risk to the business. It's damaging user trust if someone can read uh, someone else's like private photos or messages, for example. Um, another uh, way that can be effective is describing it in terms of rel reliability or uptime. You know, this is degrading the performance uh, of our app. And also how to fix it should be concise and clear. And you can have some links to additional docs and resources with uh, more info. Uh, and then finally, use tools to enforce the safe pattern. Uh, for example, using lightweight static analysis to ensure that these safe patterns are used everywhere. OK, so that was a high level uh, description of the methodology. Let's get a, a bit more detail and, and discuss how we can make this real. So specifically, let's talk about how to set up continuous code scanning, what are the best practices, and also how do we check for these escape hatches, you know, the ways to make it insecure in secure frameworks. So there's been a ton of great work in continuous scanning by a bunch of companies uh, over the past years, um, say Twitter, Salesforce, Netflix, Cisco, PayPal, uh, Coinbase, Datadog, Dow Jones, et cetera. All these companies and many more have given uh, talks, and some have released tools uh, about how to do this. So there's some differences between different companies' approaches, but there are some fundamental principles that I think are generally true. So uh, most people agree on the following best practices. So let's look at what those are. So most companies choose to scan at the pull request level of granularity. Uh, so before code is uh, merged into, say, develop or the master branch. Um, if you scan every commit, that can be a bit too noisy because sometimes there's work in progress commits that won't uh, end up getting merged in. Ideally, scans are fast, say, taking five minutes or less, because you want to give developers context when uh, the code is still in their head and that's still what they're working on. 
Uh, if you do want to do longer or more in-depth scans, say daily or weekly, uh, asynchronously is also possible. But ideally, we're giving a lot of the checks, uh, a lot of the feedback to them immediately. Many companies have two different scanning workflows. So you have an audit workflow, which is uh, for the security team, where uh, you're basically just getting visibility into things that might be dangerous. So, hey, you know, someone's doing crypto here or they're parsing XML there. It's not necessarily a vulnerability, but it's something you want to know about. And then the other workflow is blocking, where you flagged an issue that you're very sure that this is uh, probably a security issue. Maybe you blocked the build and you want developers to fix it immediately. Uh, finally, we want to make adjustment easy. So we want to make it cheap and easy to add or remove tools and add new rules to existing tools. This is a figure from a uh, paper by Google called uh, Tricorder, where they describe uh, their internal code scanning and sort of how it works and what properties they want. Um, so one thing that I think is very important is showing tool findings within developer systems. We don't want them to have to log into a separate security system because that uh, disrupts their workflow. So ideally, we're, for example, commenting on the pull request. Uh, again, these messages should be clear and actionable with a link to more info. And we want to capture some metrics, you know, which check types are firing often. Are we seeing a lot of cross-site scripting or say access control bugs and so forth? We want to keep track of you know, which scans are uh, taking too long. Maybe we need to improve them. And also the false positive rate. One thing uh, Google described, which is very interesting, is that they track uh, how often developers mark individual checks as not useful. And they actually evict checks um, that uh, decrease below a, a threshold. So one thing that's important to keep in mind with this is you know, reporting so many uh, false positives causes ill will, to, ill will with developers. And it's just too much security team operational cost as well. OK, so once we've set up um, continuous scanning, now we'll like, what are actually we looking for and how? So if we're using secure frameworks that have strong invariants, all we need to do is detect functions that let you, let you escape and do something dangerous. So for example, in React, dangerously set inner HTML, maybe exec or eval, things that uh, can run arbitrary code if an attacker could provide input there. Uh, raw SQL statements, so things that are not um, properly parameterized, and maybe some organization-specific things, like maybe there's a, a concept of super user in your application, and that's potentially dangerous, uh, something you'd want to audit. OK, so how are we going to find these escape hatches? Uh, a couple of approach. So one is grep, which is very fast, easy to use, easy to sort of customize regular expressions. So uh, that's great. Uh, but it's focused on sort of a specific line, and it operates on source code as strings. So it, it's not aware of like source code structure, like um, you know this is a comment, this is a string literal, this is a uh, if statement, this is a function call. Um, it's not aware of those things, which can make it uh, very prone to uh, false positives as well as not being able to express more complicated code patterns. Um, you can also have a code aware linter. Um, which is aware of uh, source code structure, usually by parsing source code into an abstract syntax tree or AST. Um, so again, the checks here are a bit more robust and precise because you can understand whether something's white space or a comment. Um, but you, if you have a number of languages in your company, probably uh, you would need different parsers for different languages, and they handle ASTs differently. You have to learn different syntax. So it's, it's a bit of ongoing work, but not impossible. Uh, OK, so is there anything else that we could use? Uh, so it turns out there is. Uh, so my company has been uh, pushing forward a tool called uh, SEMGREP, which is an open source lightweight static analysis tool. Uh, it was actually originally developed at Facebook, uh, where they used it to enforce over 1,000 different secure code patterns. Um, so it was started around uh, a number of years ago, but we're just pushing it forward. And so like, what is it? It's uh, customizable. It's lightweight. Uh, it can be used to find bugs, as well as enforce uh, secure code patterns and invariants. Uh, there's hundreds of existing community rules you can leverage. And the, the idea is we're trying to combine the speed and customization of grep with the expressiveness and power of a traditional static analysis tool. So you can run it offline on uncompiled code. Uh, and it's pretty fast. Not as fast as grep, but uh, much faster than most traditional SAS tools. Uh, and then one thing that I think is especially powerful is uh, you don't have to learn a separate domain-specific language when you're writing patterns to try to find, say, Java code you write uh, essentially Java code to find it, and same with Python and so forth. So uh, it's LGPL licensed, and it has a number of languages supported already, uh, Python, Go, Java, JavaScript, JSON, Ruby, C, OCaml, and a number of others. OK, so going back to the various approaches, so uh, nice things about SimGrip. So it's a single tool, supports multiple languages, and the pattern language is very simple. 
Um, sometimes in languages, there's multiple ways to do the same thing that are sort of semantically equivalent, and SimGrep will handle that for you. We'll see that in a second. Uh, but downsides, uh, it is slower than grep, and it doesn't support every language, which grep obviously does because it uh, doesn't care of the source code structure. Okay, so let's look at some quick examples. So here, uh, this pattern, we want to find calls uh, where the function is exec. And this dot, dot, dot means, you know, I don't care about the arguments. It could be zero or more. So um, on line four, we see we're catching uh, exec with a hard-coded string and on line six, uh, a variable. So line eight, we are not flagging this function uh, correctly because uh, it's not actually exec, it's some exec, which is a different function. So with grep, this would probably uh, be a false positive, uh, but we don't care about white space uh, or new lines in the middle. So these are potential um, false negatives if you were to use uh, grep. Uh, and we are correctly not flagging uh, this call to exec that's in a comment or in a string literal. So if you'd like to play around with this, uh, you can actually go to this link and uh, use SEMgrep in your browser without installing anything. Sometimes we want to be a little bit more precise, and we care about what type is involved. So for example, in Java or Golang, you might say, I want to find the method exec, but only if it's on an object of type runtime. So that's uh, exactly what we're doing here. So this um, parentheses runtime dollar sign x says find any object of type runtime and then find execs and we don't care about the arguments. So here we see that on line seven and nine, we are flagging because those are of type runtime, uh, but we are not flagging on line 12 because this is a uh, exec called on an other type object. So this is just another way to let your queries be uh, a little bit more precise. Okay, so we can actually flag business logic flaws as well. So every company has uh, certain issues that are probably endemic to their code bases and how they work. So let's say um, it's a financial trading application and you need to call verify transaction before make transaction, and if not, it's a bug. So SEMgrep actually allows you to do a Boolean composition of patterns where you can say this must be true and this must be true, or this but not that, or either of these things can be true. Um, so here what we're saying is find every uh, function that calls make transaction and then filter out every function which calls verify transaction before make transaction. Uh, so what I think uh, is very powerful about this is you can easily express uh, custom uh, business logic or uh, other um, security guarantees you want that are specific to your company. So many uh, SaaS tools out of the box have a bunch of rules, but they don't necessarily uh, are tailored to your environment because they've never seen it before. But with just, say, eight or nine, nine lines of code, we're able to write something specific to our company uh, that we can enforce everywhere. Uh, so ideally, we want to give developers feedback as soon as possible. So there is a uh, alpha VS Code extension. And one thing that's nice with security tools is we don't want to just flag issues that need to be fixed. Ideally, we want to make it as easy to fix them as possible. Um, so SimGrep actually has functionality where you can say, OK, we want to fetch, uh, match any call to exec and uh, auto fix it with sys.exec. Um, so this is a way where you can say, oh, this is a deprecated API. Just do this instead. And then in the pull request, you can just say, like, accept fix. Um, so just a nice way to make uh, developers do the right thing even uh, more easily. All right, so lastly, I want to chat a little bit about some community uh, collaborations we've been working on. Uh, so we've been chatting a lot with a number of people in OWASP uh, involved with uh, ASVS as well as cheat sheets. So our goal is. Uh, the following. So one is, you know, ASVS lists a number of security controls and is an excellent standard for how to harden your code base and make it resistant to many attacks. But the problem is, you know, manually doing code review is very time intensive as well as, um, you know, your code is changing and maybe you have hundreds of repos. So how can we see what is the security posture of many applications quickly? So our goal is to have a series of checks that make it trivial to say, oh, we are fulfilling uh, ASVS level one across these repos, but we need to focus on these other ones. Uh, another thing we're working on is how can we find code uh, automatically that is violating the OS cheat sheets best practice recommendations um, and maybe offer some sort of tailored developer training to make it easier. So rather than having all this knowledge locked inside documents, can we make it sort of programmatically continuously check everywhere? Um, so uh, if this sounds interesting to you and want to help, uh, we would love your help. Uh, we have a community Slack. Feel free to join it. And a big shout out to uh, Daniel, Joe, Rohit, and many others who are uh, pushing this forward. It's not just us. 
OK, so let's wrap up. So if you find eliminating bug classes interesting and you're wanting to know more about sort of the latest and greatest in DevSecOps, I gave a talk this past besides SF um, that basically distills um, probably dozens, maybe 100 or so different tools, um, other uh, talks, uh, blog posts, and so forth on um, like detection and response, threat modeling, uh, continuous scanning, all sorts of things. Um, so check that out for a number of useful resources for scaling your AppSec. Uh, also, if you're curious, I have a, a free security newsletter with uh, summaries of great talks and tools and resources and so forth that uh, feel free to sign up and uh, get a weekly distillation of um, what's going on in security to hopefully save you some time. All right, so let's wrap up. Uh, in summary, secure defaults are the best way to scalably raise your security bar, uh, not finding bugs and playing bug whack-a-mole. Uh, killing bug classes makes your AppSec team more leveraged. And the overall process here is defining a safe pattern, and then educating developers, rolling it out, and then enforcing it continuously. And ideally, you're doing that with something that's fast and lightweight, uh, such as SendGrep or any other tool that fulfills these properties. Uh, and again, we want to focus on having a strong uh, solid developer uh, user experience. So it's easy to do the right thing. So feel free to go there for these slides. And my name's Clint. Uh, feel free to reach out on Twitter or LinkedIn. And uh, there's TLDRSec again. So thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to answer questions. Clint, it was a great presentation. I I loved it, my friend. I will have thank you a couple of questions. You know, I mean, you 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 summarized everything very well, and the the, the framework making things easy. But still, I am I am curious to 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 learn about a couple of things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one thing, I mean, you say that in the last five five. 10, 15 years, uh, software development has changed a lot dramatically, going from waterfall to agile, uh, development going from separate dev and ops to DevOps teams, DevOps, and from on-prem to cloud. And you also say that security has changed uh, significantly. But still, we all know that there is uh, huge room for improvement because we are not happy where we are, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, with with the DevOps with Dev uh, at the moment. So, um, if I ask you, you know, where do we need the most important improvements or improvement uh, in terms of security, security technologies? What would you say? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we have made some pretty great progress collectively as an industry in making it easy to. Um, integrate security tooling into sort of the traditional SDLC workflow um, in terms of scanning every commit and uh, either with static or dynamic analysis. I think that's actually going pretty well. It uh, There's still a number of improvements that can and should be made, but I feel optimistic about that. Uh, I think the biggest thing to me is there, every organization, or many of them at least, have built their own internal libraries for how to do certain security sensitive things correctly by default. For example, mutual TLS between services, or uh, say parsing XML securely, or uh, storing secrets, uh, not in the source code, but in some sort of uh, secure manner. Um, there's all these classes of things that many companies have invented on their own, but I see uh, sort of a lack of optimal sharing of these. And many people are reinventing the wheel, which takes a lot of time and is sort of error prone. So I think if we can collectively as an industry sort of share these um, secure libraries that are really not specific to one org, like here's how to do this class of things securely. Um, and we had sort of generally hardened um, secure by default libraries for most uh, common web frameworks and libraries, so, such that as a developer, if I'm like, oh, I want to uh, say, unzip a tar file securely and not have to worry about, say, zip slip type issues, I can do that very trivially. I think we're not there currently. But yes, things that are internal uh, to many companies doing things securely and easily, ideally, we can share more of those and agree on some standards, as we have kind of done with React, but in more problem domains. A lot to do, huh? Yeah. <laughs> lot so, to do. <laughs> exactly. So wh where do you see AppSec and DevSecOps, whatever we are going to call it in the near future or future, I don't know. But 
where is EPSEC uh, going in, in, in DevOps in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, so uh, one thing I see is uh, historically many AppSec teams have focused on breaking, you know, finding bugs. A lot of the AppSec engineers are former pen testers or sort of security researchers. And I think that is still going to be important going forward. But I think more uh, we're going to see AppSec engineers focused on uh, either partnering with developers and being sort of like an advisory role, sitting in on meetings and advising like architecture and implementation decisions, as well as really uh, being in some in some ways security focused developers themselves. So building the secure by default libraries and infrastructure and services that developers can then use. So previously very focused on attacking and breaking, and I think going forward we're going to see a more emphasis on building. So anything that the developers need to do. Um, not just one-offs, but consistently throughout the org, I think the security teams are going to be focused on how do we build a paved road, uh, to use Netflix's terminology, such that they can just do their jobs uh, quickly and securely and effectively. So building rather than breaking is where I see AppSec headed. Perfect. You know, uh, I love your presentation from, you know, basics, basics, basics. I mean, uh, emphasizing the secure defaults and you saying, uh, Facebook, Google, my, Microsoft, all these guys are emphasizing that at the moment. They understand uh, breaking things or finding bugs is not good enough at the moment. And it is, it is really important. Uh, so, but what about you? I mean, if you want us to remember one thing uh, from your presentation, what do you want us to remember? <laughs> That's a good question. I would say, uh, Put yourself in the shoes of the developers in your organization. Think, what are the things they need to regularly do that are potentially security relevant, where they may, uh, uh, if there is a misstep, then uh, there could be a serious issue. And then sort of categorically, one by one, solve those issues for them, uh, either via a um, security library or a service, something that they can use such that they don't even have to think about security. They can just take something you built, use it, and they're done. So in short, think of everything security relevant your developers need to do, make it easy for them so that it's even easier than doing it themselves on their own. And can I add one, one thing? Don't, don't, don't say, I am not Google, you know, I don't have enough resources. Don't accept to be a victim. Uh, go solve the problem because there is, for everyone, enough resource to solve the problem if you do it wisely, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think even if you think you don't have the resources to do it, you will be investing more resources over time, fixing the same issues over and over again, than if you were to have a uh, sort of more systematic solution. So like you are going to pay the cost. It's just whether you're going to pay a medium amount to solve it for a lot of cases, or a little bit, but like forever. Right. So you do have the resources. It's whether you're, how you're going to spend them, I think is the key. I agree. I agree. Man, it was great presentation again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks for having we me. Will, we, will, we will have you again uh, today. I believe it is very important because uh, the, the audience, our guests are willing to ask questions and we will be together once again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Clint. Take care. Yeah. Thanks See so much soon. for having me. See you soon. Thank you. Take care. Yes, my friend, perfect.